We are so glad to have you all here. Welcome back to our seminar, Revelation of Jesus Christ. And we want to say welcome not only to our local audience, but also to the online audience. And we are coming live from our Wachita Hills College campus. We're so glad to be here with our four students, which are taking us on an exciting journey through Bible prophecy. And through these presentations, they, their sincere desire is to connect people with Jesus Christ. Nothing better than having a connection, a personal connection with the King of Kings. And before that, do you mind if we go to the Lord in prayer? Let's kneel, if possible. Father, we are so glad to have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to look to, to know it is possible for us to have victory, to know that you can prepare us for the coming King, that we may be received into the kingdom of glory. Lord, please prepare our hearts and be with the speaker tonight, that we may hear something from heaven, an absolute truth, Father, that we may know that we are part of the beloved Church of the Firstborn Above, in Jesus' name, amen. Our speaker tonight is Jace Addison, coming from Hickle, Texas, and is, he's training to become a uh, pastoral medical missionary. Jace has recently joined the church just under two years, and as the Lord led him out of witchcraft, and God has opened his mind to the truth as it is in Jesus Christ, and his love is to share it with the people. And tonight we get to be part of it, to listen as the Lord uh, speak to him, that we may learn some et eternal truth that we can apply and live joyfully in the sight of Jesus Christ. And the message tonight is entitled, The Coming King. The Coming King. And before that, we will be hearing uh, a message in music by a quartet by our students as we prepare our hearts for the message. Thank you. I have fixed my mind on another time, on another time. I have set my face on the narrow way, on the Oh, Lord, come quickly, this is 
Wow, thank you for the music. You know, hearing that just made this message really come together for me after studying it out, after going over it time after time. And I want to thank the Lord for special music. Amen. 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 So for those who are listening, um, especially those back home, my hometown is Hico, Texas, not Hico, Texas. We really, they, we throw a big fit about that whenever people say Hico. But um, I really just want to thank you all for tuning in and thank you all for coming here. It's really been a blessing to hear all the messages so far. And how many of you enjoyed Joshua Holly's message last Saturday? Amen. I know I did. You know, he went over the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And it is my privilege tonight to share with you about the kingdom that will never fade away, the kingdom that will never end, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so, we've entitled this message, We've entitled this message, The Coming King. But before we go into this message, I'd like to just offer up one more prayer of grace to God. (laughs) I really need His mercy. Heavenly Father, as I come into Your presence, Lord, I want to thank You for the blessings that You have provided for us, that even in a time of trouble like this, with what all is happening with the country, We can still come to you as we are and know that we are safe and secure in your arms. And Father, I pray that you please give everyone listening a peace about the events that are happening today. And I would also ask that you would give me a peace too as I share with everyone the message of hope that you have prepared for us. And I want to ask all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So before we talk about the coming king, I like to talk about his servant. So in Luke 3, we can see the story of John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was a servant of servants, besides Jesus Christ, of course. This man lived in the wilderness of Judea for most of his life, living on a very simple, plain diet, dressing in really uncomfortable camel skin, hair garments and wearing a leather belt this man lived a life of self-sacrifice and all of this was to prepare him for one mission one mission and in the peak of john the baptist ministry he would have thousands and thousands of people coming to him and asking him different things concerning the bible about the law of god and he would simply say, repent, repent, therefore, because the kingdom of God is at hand. And all of this, all these thousands of people lined up to see him ended with him baptizing the Savior, Jesus Christ, and directing all their attention to this man. And you know, when we think of honor, we usually think of politicians We think of kings, we think of actors that are famous, but God has a different idea of what honor really consists of. You know, in the Bible, Matthew 11, 11, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say unto you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. You know, Jesus did not consider Caesar or the religious priesthood to be of the same league as John the Baptist. And it really just goes to show that God's idea of honor is completely different from ours. But John, even though he was blessed with the special mission, he did not allow this to get to his head because he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who comes after me is mightier than I, and whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. 
John had a very humble outlook on himself because he knew that just like you and I, he was a sinner in need of grace, needing the blood of the Lamb. What's really interesting about John the Baptist is he's one of the few people that actually had their ministry prophesied by the Bible. If we, if we look through Isaiah 40, verse 3, it prophesies of uh, John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And this was the mission of John the Baptist. You know, in ancient times, the servants of the kings would oftentimes run miles ahead of the king while he was riding in his chariot to go to the next city. And they would get out the rocks from the highway. They would fill in potholes. They would make sure that there's no danger lying ahead of the king. And in the same way, John the Baptist was preparing the way of the Lord, the soon coming of the Lord. And his ministry was just one of the prophecies that were predicted in the Old Testament that came to fruition in the New Testament because God wanted us to know that his son really is the Messiah. In fact, uh, students at Goshen College, they actually did a research project where they went through the entire Old Testament and found as many prophecies as they could concerning the first advent or the first coming of Jesus Christ. And they found around 300 prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and his first advent alone. Now, to put that in perspective, the chances of one man fulfilling just eight, eight prophecies is like filling up the entire state of Texas with two feet of silver dollars, marking one of these silver dollars, and then asking a blind man to go pick the right, the right coin. The likelihood is just not there. But whenever we think about the fact that Jesus fulfilled 300 prophecies, that's the equivalent of marking an atom in the observable universe and asking the blind man to go pick the right atom. It just doesn't happen. It does not happen at all. And God gave us these prophecies so we would know without a doubt that his word is true and Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And if you think that is powerful, there in the New Testament, there is one in every five verses, it directly deals with Jesus Christ's second coming. And if the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ's first advent were true, then we can be guaranteed that his second advent prophecies are coming true as well. Even as we're sitting here today, there are prophecies telling us about the soon coming of Christ that are fulfilling in our world today. And many of us have uh, a severe incident in our mind, the coronavirus. And as we read this, we're going to take a little more look. We're going to take a better look at all the prophecies concerning the soon coming of Jesus Christ. So what are some of the signs? Well, one is there will be false Christ and false prophets, and they will show great and mighty wonders, insomuch if it were possible to deceive the very elect. So they will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they shall deceive many. So many of us probably don't know a false Christ, right? We might know of them, but we don't know one personally. Uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever we see these stories and headlines about all these um, really weird wilderness guys going and proclaiming that they're Jesus Christ, we often think, man, these guys are really off their ro rocker. For example, these men right here, the one on the right, the man on uh, the right is called uh, I-N-R-I, or Iniri, which is actually an uh, allusion to the sign that was put on top of the cross at Jesus Christ's crucifixion. This man lives in Brazil, and he has 12 followers that push him around on a white pedestal wherever he wants to go. But we think, okay, there's 12 guys that are fooled by this really weird guy in Brazil. 
but the one on the left, he's, he's definitely a, a different story. He actually has 5,000 followers in the wilderness of Siberia, and he, <laughs> he claims to be Jesus. He claims that he is um, the born-again prince, even though he, his last occupation was a security guard. Really interesting guy. Um, and it's almost humorous, but what we don't realize is there is a lot of false Christ today. Some that we don't really even think of as false Christ. For example, how many of you know the man on the top right? Jay-Z, right? So, do you know what he calls himself? Jehovah. So, Jay-Z claims to be God incarnate. And many different interviews, and even in his song lyrics, he propagates his title for himself. Now, whether he's trying to get rap credit or anything of this nature, trying to be rebellious, that's not quite for sure. But what we do know is he is claiming to be Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now, the man on his left, David Koresh, this is a very interesting individual. In uh, 1993, David Koresh led a group of 75 people called the Branch Davidians to form a compound in Waco, Texas, where he and them stockpiled weapons and had all kinds of weird practices which involved polygamy and other things of that nature. And eventually their practices got people kind of worried. They were like, all right, these guys are starting polygamy, they're stockpiling weapons. They called the government and the FBI gave them uh, about a week or two to disarm themselves and they started negotiating. But unfortunately, David Koresh, he led in a full attack against the FBI and there was gunfire between the two, which led into the death of everyone in the compound. It's a really unfortunate event. And below him, we have Kanye West. Now, before Kanye West's really interesting conversion experience, he claimed to be Yeezy, Jesus Christos, or many different names. He basically said that he is God. And this is before his recent experience, and I don't want to cast judgment on anyone. That's not what I'm here to do. Uh, But what I am saying is that whenever you're claiming to be Jesus Christ, you're deceived. It's as simple as that. And then on the right next to him, we have the Beatles. Now the Beatles revolutionized the rock world in the 70s, and they were claiming to be atheists, yet they studied through the uh, practices of Aleister Crowley, and they repeatedly bashed on Jesus Christ, Christianity as a whole, and they even said that they were more influential than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Here we see a a very uh, blasphemous picture of them holding the upside-down crosses, and they give all their credit and success, actually, to Satan. And you can look all this up. Don't just take my word for it. Do your research. So, in the last days, there's other deceptions. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, it reads, This know also, that in the last days perilous time shall come, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth truth breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And we are counseled from such, turn away. Now, whenever we hear this passage, we often think of people who are maybe out of the church, living a really rough lifestyle, but I want to draw your attention to this point right here. It says, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. These are people that are in the church. These are people that might be in the room These are people that might be listening online. But how do we know if we ourselves are falling into this group? Jesus Christ says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. 
Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of, of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So what kind of fruits is Jesus talking about right here? What, what is it that we are to actually look for to make sure that we are not part of those individuals mentioned in 2 Timothy? Well, in Galatians 5, through 23, we read, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So if we have these manifesting in our hearts, family, then we know that we're not part of that group because by their fruits you shall know them. And if we have these in our lives, then we can know for certain that Jesus Christ is living in us. And that's the only way that we can produce these fruits is if Christ and in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit abides in our hearts today and produces fruits of righteousness. So another way that we can tell that we're not in that group is if we speak according to the word of God. Now, we're told in Isaiah 8.20, To the law and unto the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So, if we see in the Bible that the Bible says, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, and go and sin no more, all these different commands that Jesus gives us, and we don't believe that Christ can give us victory over sin, then we're not speaking according to the word of God. We're not truly living according to the word of God. And if we don't believe that we can overcome sin, well, then we're going to be lost because our unbelief will hinder God from working in our lives as he wants to. Another sign that we're seeing more and more of nowadays is natural disasters. Between 2004 and 2014, 18 earthquakes with magnitudes of 8.0 or more rattled subjection zones around the globe. That is an increase of 265% over the average rate in the previous century. And then we also have half of the world's wildlife population has been lost in the last 40 years due to human abuses of power, whether it's the natural disasters or it's just pollution of the environment in general from just simple ignorance. But regardless of the fact, so many of the ecosystems of the world is being destroyed. And another sign that the world is soon to expect its soon coming savior is that men's hearts will fail them for fear. Now, with this coronavirus taking place, we see that our entire country is shut down. Our entire economy is about to collapse. But how are there going to be people that go through this time and don't fear about what this world is throwing at them. They don't fear about all these signs. They don't fear that they see everything in this world may be vain and soon going away. It's because they know that the more and more these things happen, the closer Jesus Christ is to coming again. It's that simple. So how will Jesus come back? It's not enough to know that he's coming soon. We have to know exactly how he's coming because if we don't, then we could easily be deceived by false Christ just like those thousands of people were. And let's just go through a couple of uh, prophecies concerning Jesus Christ's actual second coming. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a whisper. Shout with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. The Lord shall roar on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout. Amen? Amen. Our Lord shall come and shall not keep silent. And all 
shall be very temptuous about him, meaning stormy around him. He's going to come in the clouds. There's going to be a massive storm following him. Now, why is Jesus Christ coming back with shouts, with roars? This is strong language. Well, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will rejoice over you with singing. He is so excited to see his children ready for him to come back. He is so excited that he finally gets to, to bring us back home, to be free from this world of pain. He is so excited to see us face to face. And oh, I know that I'm going to be excited that day too by his grace. Man. Another sign that this is the true second coming of Christ is that, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up and there will be an earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And then shall all appear, uh, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every high shall see him. So every eye will see him. Will he just appear out of nowhere and take a few people away from the earth and suddenly you look over and then half the room's gone? No, that's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible says at all. In fact, it's going to be so noticeable. Imagine if you're sitting down and an angel appears before you. You know how much a light an angel has? In Sodom and Gomorrah, an angel had enough light to blind the men, all of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they fell down. They, didn't, they couldn't see anymore. Imagine if an angel revealed itself right here tonight. What would happen? Would you notice? I would hope you would notice. Jesus, when he comes back, he will come with all of his holy angels he will come with an innumerable company of angels, so bright even, that something very interesting is going to happen to the wicked. So what will happen to the wicked at the second coming of Christ? When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, there was, a, there was an event that took place not too long ago in American history. How many of you are familiar with the Hiroshima bombing? It was a very unfortunate event, one of the products of war. And World War II, ranging from 1939 to 45. An American B-29 bomber dropped the biggest payload at that time, nuclear weaponry, on Hiroshima and killed 80,000 people instantly. 90% of the city was wiped away and many died from radiation poisoning later. Now, for those who are too close to the blast radius, all that's left of them is a shadow. That's it. The Hiroshima shadows are very famous. They, they really just show the magnitude of what light can do in, in extreme circumstances. And if we can make a bomb that's so bright to make people turn into just shadows on the wall, how much more do you think Jesus Christ is going to burn the wicked immediately? It's going to be powerful and everyone's going to be able to know like oh it's happening it's here 
So what about the righteous? We talked about the wicked, but what about the righteous? What are they going to expect? Well, first, the righteous dead are going to rise first with Jesus and meet him in the air. What about the righteous living? Well, the righteous living will be changed into incorruption. We will see this body of pain, of cancers, of disease changed immediately into an immortal body that knows no pain, knows no fatigue, knows no disease. And Jesus Christ will come with healing in his wings. But what did it take Jesus? How much did Jesus have to give to allow us to have healing? In Isaiah 53, verse 5, says he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed so the only reason jesus is going to be able to give us new and restored bodies is because he took the guilt the pain and the abuse that we inflict upon ourselves upon himself He took our pain upon himself so that he could give us a beautiful, restored body. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the resurrected saints, and the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And there we'll never have to part again from our families that have died in the Lord. We'll never have to say goodbye ever again because we will always be living in the presence of Jesus and heaven will be our home. The entire universe at that point will be our home and if we want to say hi to our family, God's not going to say, no, you can't say hi to them. They're, they're in the dust. No, God's going to say, go to them. Have fun. Explore my creation and explore my character. So, What is it going to take for us to be part of the righteous group? Well, first we have to get used to the light of God's second coming, the beauty, the glory of Jesus Christ, so we're not blinded by the light of his second coming. Have you all ever been in a really dark area and then all of a sudden they shine some floodlights on you or you get spotlighted? Has anyone had that happen to them? I know my friends back in Texas, they, they know about this. Oftentimes, deer hunters will just shine brights on you immediately, and you're like, what are you doing? But it blinds you for a second. But the thing is, if we don't want to be blinded at his second coming, we have to get used to looking at the light and the glory of his character today. We have to allow the God that created the light to shine out of darkness, to shine in our hearts through the face of Jesus Christ. And by beholding, but we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So not only will we be used to the light that God is going to bring at his second coming, but we ourselves are going to be changed into the same image of Jesus Christ. And whenever we see him, Jesus Christ, face to face, we're going to realize some similarities between us two. As we behold him more and more, we're going to see the perfect image, this perfect image of peace and love, of humility, of just self-sacrificing, caring love. And we're going to be like, wow, you've really been changing me to look a lot like you this entire time. If we keep our eyes focused on him, it'll happen. And eventually, we'll be able to say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Jesus Christ is extending an invitation out to us all tonight. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. Jesus Christ is telling us all these words to us personally tonight. He wants us to know that he wants us to be with him. He has a heart need 
for every single one of us. There was once a mother of eight children. All our children grew up and were living away from home. Uh, some of them were very close to her so they could visit her every week or so. And regardless, all the family members would be there on the holidays. All except for one. You see, John, he was a troubled child. He always fought with his brothers and sisters. He always stole from his mother's purse. And whenever he got older, he got in trouble with the law time after time again until eventually he left home. And when he left home, he only lasted a couple years out in the real world until he got mixed up with the wrong crowd again and he was arrested for serious crimes and had to spend the rest of his life in jail. Whenever he was arrested afterwards, they always had holidays still. The children would always come and they'd talk about the good old days. They'd talk about, you know, the last Thanksgiving. They'll talk about their father. They'll talk about all the different experiences that they got to enjoy together. But the mother, after that first holiday of John not being with her, she was never the same. She would constantly look at this one spot where John always sat and she would just be reserved. She was just not all there all the time anymore. And all the children knew. And they can only imagine what she felt. Did you know that Jesus Christ loves us more than our mothers love us? That it doesn't matter if he has every single person there that could have been saved, but he's missing you because there is a place waiting for you in his heart. And if he doesn't have you with him, he won't be the same. He's going to look at that empty spot that you should have taken and he's going to say, if only they chose me instead of their sin. If only they chose me. Tonight, those of you listening, you might not know God as a true personal Savior, as a friend that sticks closer than a brother and a mother that will always be by our side and that wants us in the kingdom so much. Tonight I want to extend an invitation to you from our God and say that He wants you there. And if you will, tonight, allow Him into your heart you will find a friend that is always so faithful and he will give you a peace that passes all understanding and whenever he looks at you in heaven he's going to imagine the ceaseless ages of eternity that he gets to spend with you doing all kinds of things things that we can't even comprehend here on earth so filled with love so filled with peace and if this is your desire I pray, I pray that God sustains you and that as you allow Jesus Christ into your heart today, that you would pray to him, Lord, show me your character, show me your love, show me how to be more like you. And if this is your heart's desire, I invite you to bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the sweet promises that one day you're going to take this world of pain away from us and give us a world of peace that one day we don't have to constantly worry about the future but that we can look at you face to face see the ways that you have led us in the past and see the ways that you're going to lead us in the future face to face lord And for those who have accepted you into their hearts tonight, I want to ask and pray, Lord, that you would please abide with them and make them ready for your soon second coming. And there may be others, Lord, who have tasted of your love, who have felt 
the presence of your glory, of your love. But Father, their love has waxed cold. Father, I just want to ask and pray that you would show them your character, that you would show them that you love them, Lord, and that you would melt their hearts of stone and give them hearts for love alone. Father, this is my prayer, and I ask that you make it righteous because of your Son, not because of anything in me, not because of anything in us, but because of what you have done on the cross. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have a special message by Mark Kindy the next time we meet. And his message is the Prince of Pride and the King of Peace. And in it, we're going to learn more and more of our character, uh, of the character of Jesus, and how we can really trust and abide in him and just look fuller into his face. And I want to invite all you listening that you would tune in at that time. What time is it by any chance? 11 o'clock Saturday morning. And we invite you and we wish you a happy prayer meeting. (laughs) And uh, you have a blessed day now. Thank you. We are so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Watch the Hills Academy and College. If you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to help support the making of these programs, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you for joining us, and may God richly bless you.